From the University of Arizona Distance Learning Program, this is Optical Sciences 505, Diffraction and Interferometry, with Dr. James Wyant. This broadcast is authorized by the Arizona Board of Regents on behalf of the University of Arizona. Any reproduction or retransmission of this course or use of same for granting of credit without the express written consent of the University of Arizona is strictly prohibited. Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. I want to uh, start out by reminding you that Thursday of next week, February 26, see what happens that day? Does anyone know? Exam. Okay. Who do we play in basketball that day? What? Stanford? That's scary. Maybe it's lucky that you're getting the exam. Uh, I'm not sure is that right. Anyway, if we do play Stanford that day, you may be lucky that um, you're getting the exam before the game and not after the game. Of course, I'll be grading it after the game, I guess. Also, I'm sure everyone has been um, wondering, when is the final exam? And for those of you who can't sleep nights because you're worried about that, it's on uh, May 14th, 8 a.m. Okay. Well, last class we were talking about multiple beam interference. And um, I have some uh, notes I'm handing out over here on my left. and. Uh, if you haven't picked them up, maybe you should. Yes, uh-huh. Okay, question 26, part D. C? Okay, um, refresh my memory. Oh, is that the one where we, we have a spherical surface on top of a flat surface? And uh, initially, they're touching in the center. And uh, the, the question maybe was a little confusing. I had so many students stop in to see me, because um, I call these things mirrors, uh, but they're partially transmitting mirrors. And so it really was like a Newton's uh, rings experiment, what it, the problem was supposed to be. So we have circular fringes, and the question was, how much do we have to tip the flat plate relative to the spherical plate such that we have no closed fringes? Is that right? Well, if we think for a second, when we have closed fringes, the center of the closed fringes will be where the two surfaces are tangent to one another. And so if I take this flat surface and begin tipping it sideways, the portion that is tangent to the sphere, uh, the location that's going to move sideways. And so the center of the closed fringes will move sideways. Until finally I tip it just enough such that I'm tangent right at the edge of the sphere. And now the closed fringes are centered right at the edge of the sphere. So I tip a fuzz more. And uh, what that means is that I will have no points where the two surfaces are parallel to one another. And so I will not have closed fringes. OK. Everyone follow that? Any other questions on the homework? This homework set should have been uh, easier and faster than the previous one? Is that true? Is that? Oh, uh, that's fiction. OK. Just wait to the next one. No, actually, I haven't looked at the next one, so I don't. I think it will be pretty, pretty easy. But the next one covers multiple beam interference, so maybe we'd better talk about multiple beam interference here. So if we go back um, to the last class, and I started to say you have handouts over here on the left that we're going to be following for the first part of the lecture. So if you don't have them, you should pick them up. And those of you out in TV land, um, again, I guess I'll, I'll simply say they're in the mail. Uh, they will also be on the internet uh, later today. Um, anyway, last class, what we said, we had these uh, two surfaces. We have a beam coming in at some angle theta prime. Inside, it's an angle theta. The reflection from outside was R. From our side was R prime and transmitting outside the in was little t for amplitude, and inside the out was t prime, thickness d. And we found, and I don't know if you can see this equation, but the reflectance was whatever you have incident on this plus first reflected beam, first reflected beam says r, and then the beam comes through here, 
through here. So you get TT prime and R prime e to the i delta, uh, delta being the, the 2 pi over lambda 2 nd cosine theta, and so on out until you, the last term here for the pth beam coming out here would be T, T prime, R prime, 2 p minus 3, e to the i p minus 1 delta. So, and for the reflected beam, we had a you know, somewhat similar expression anyway that when is e, what do we have incident e sub i t t prime times one plus r prime squared e to the i delta r prime the fourth e to the two i delta and so on. So now what we need to do is to sum these up, and I think that's about where we were right at the end of the class. We'd gone through the the Stokes relations. And uh, we were now about ready to sum these up. So if we could zoom in on this portion right here, and I gave this a number 7.1.3 for the reflected light. Uh, and just repeating here the equation we had before for the reflected electric field. And noting that what we really have here is a geometrical series. And when we solve geometrical series, um, Remember, we can, what we do, we multiply this by the next term, and then we subtract the two and solve for the original series. And when we do that, we get something that goes as the stuff we have out in front times 1 minus what the next term would be, and uh, or what the next term would be looking up here, divided by 1 minus the ratio between consecutive terms. So we get a 1 minus r prime to the 2 p minus 1, e to the i, p minus 1 delta. And down in the basement, we have 1 minus r prime squared, e to the i delta. OK. Now, what we want to do next is, from Stokes' relations, we had the difference in the two ref reflections here. Amplitude and reflections was simply a 180-degree phase change. So we want to put in here that r is equal to minus r prime. The other thing we're going to do here is we're going to let p go to infinity. We're going to let the number of reflected terms go to infinity. And normally that works pretty well. Um, and that's the way you normally see this um, derivation done. But if we think for a second, there's one instance where that will not work. And that is if we have, say, a laser with a short, a short laser pulse. Um, the pulse may be short enough that we can't, you know, we don't have an infinite number of beams uh, interfering. So in that case, we could not let p go to infinity. But for right now, let's let p go to infinity and see what we get. And the thing that helps us here a lot is that r prime is always less than 1. The reflectance is always less than 1. So whatever it is, as close as you want to 1 is as you uh, can get, when we raise that to the infinite power, it's going to go to zero. And so our expression here for the reflected electric field is simply whatever we have instant times r, that's the very first guy reflected, minus t t prime r e to the i delta, 1 minus r squared e to the i delta. So we get the first reflected beam. Get out my piece of paper here. We get the first reflected beam, and then we get subtracted from that all these other guys. Or at least we have a, a minus sign here in all these other guys. Perhaps the e to the i delta will change the minus to a, a positive. But first guy and everything else. And now we just have to play with this a little bit to um, get it in the form that you find in the books. So we first get a common denominator here, 1 minus r squared e to the i delta. And uh, then we note here that we could factor out e to the i delta from these two. So we get 1 minus r squared plus t t prime e to the i delta. And I uh, should say this derivation is given in you know, many books. I think I, I'm following maybe more closely Born and Wolf than anything else. Uh, from Stokes' relations here, uh, r squared plus t t prime was 1. We have no absorption right now. Later, we're going to worry about absorption. But right now, there's no absorption. And then 
little r, I just set that equal to capital R, the intensity reflectance, the square root of capital R, and r squared becomes r. Okay. Well, that's the amplitude. And so what we want to do now is to go in and calculate the intensity or radiance. So we take E sub R times E sub R complex conjugate. And out in front, we'll get E sub I squared, or we'll write it as I sub I. That's the initial intensity. R, multiplying this out, we get 2 minus 2 cosine delta. And down in the basement, we'll get 1 plus R squared minus 2R cosine delta. And that's still not quite the form we normally see it. But we'll use a trig identity. 1 minus cosine delta is 2 sine squared of delta over 2. Plug that in. And we get um, a form that's close to the form you normally see it. We'll make one change in a minute, but this is basically it that the initial, or the reflectance over the initial, is 4r sine squared delta over 2, 1 minus r squared plus 4r sine delta over 2, or sine squared or delta over 2. And we will um, we'll leave this for the time being, and then we're going to come back to it. We're going to change it a little bit, and then we're going to talk about it. We're going to plot it. Um, and. Uh, well, we'll spend more time on it for right now. Let's go on to the transmitted light. And I'll take a sip of coffee, a sip of medicine before we do that. Transmitted light. Well, just copying over from a previous page all the terms. Uh, and again, uh, it's a geometrical series. And... Uh, we we'll solve it the same way we solved the one above. And so we get an E sub i, the incident, t, t prime, 1 minus the next term. So 1 minus r prime to the 2p, e to the i, p delta. And down in the basement, then uh, 1 minus r prime squared, e to the i delta. And we're going to let p go to infinity. Assuming we have a, a pulse that's long enough that we can do that. And so the r prime, when we raise it to the infinite power, is going to go to 0. And so we get e sub i t t prime divided 1 minus r prime squared e to the i delta. And uh, from Stokes' relations, we had t t prime was capital T, the intensity, transmittance. r prime squared was capital R, intensity reflectance. And um, we want to calculate until we get just T over 1 minus R, E to the I delta. And we need to multiply that by the complex conjugate. And um, in the same procedure as what we did above then, we would get I sub T over I sub I of T squared divided by 1 plus R squared minus 2R cosine delta. And um, then we'll use the same trig identity again. And so we'll get t squared divided by 1 minus r squared plus 4r sine squared of delta over 2. So any questions on that? Well, let's make some comments here and then put it in a form that we normally see it, and we'll make some more comments. We'll look at graphs, and then we'll make some more comments, okay? So these things, uh, I sub R over I incident, I sub T over I incident, is what we call the Aries formula. I don't know why that slipped down to this line. I'm doing this in, in Mathematica, not... I'm not really taking advantage of Mathematica as much as I'm using it as an equation editor. And I have found that Mathematica, when you, it looks great on the computer screen, but when you print, it seems to have a mind of its own sometimes. And uh, so anyway, these are the Aries formula. 
And we note here, if we go back and look at the two equations, that t plus r is equal to 1. So that, you know, if we have no losses, so t plus r is equal to 1. Then we have i sub r over i sub i plus i sub t over i sub i is equal to 1. And maybe we should, should look at that. And so if we look at, I don't know if I can get all this in one screen easily. We have this equation plus we have this equation plus we have that t plus r is 1. And so if we add these together, uh, we're going to get a um, result here that this is, that these two add up to be equal to 1. And we'll see it maybe a little better right down below here. Now, the way that we wrote the Aries formula are right. There's nothing wrong with them. But again, they're, they're not quite the way you normally see them in the, in the textbooks. And normally what you do is that you define this thing called the coefficient of finesse. Not to be confused with the finesse, which we'll talk about later. This is the coefficient of finesse, capital F. And we define that as 4R divided by 1 minus r quantity squared. And if now we take that and plug that back into the expression for i sub r and i sub t, and I won't go back to it, but it's pretty, very straightforward, you get that i sub r over i sub i is f sine squared of delta over 2 divided by 1 plus f sine squared of delta over 2. And i sub t over i sub i is 1 over 1 plus f sine squared delta over 2. And so now you certainly see as you add these two together, you're going to end up to, with unity. So these two patterns are actually, they're complements of one another. When one of these is 0, the other one is a max. When the other one is... Um, um, maximum, you know, when this is a max, that's a min. When this is a, a max, that's a min. They're complements of one another. We'll see some graphs in just a second showing that also. And that, again, goes back to conservation of energy. There are no losses. We're, we're assuming right now we have no absorption. Before we look at some plots here, uh, a couple more things we might say, just staring at these two equations a little bit. Put them up there so you can stare. So what equation did you dream about last night? I don't know. So what's wrong with you people? I don't know. Okay. If we look at I sub R over I sub I, it goes independent of the value of f, which is saying independent of the value of r, this will go to 0. Okay, Independent of r. But it's going to go to 1 only in the limit that r goes to 1. Okay? Because then limit r goes to 1, this is going to become much larger than that when sine is equal to 1. And so we're going to have 1 f sine over f sine squared over f sine squared. So in a limit r goes to 1, that's going to go to 1. i sub t over i sub i goes to 0, or excuse me, goes to 1 for all values of r. Independent of r, when this sine squared is equal to 0, this is going to be 1. But i sub t over i sub i will go to 0 only in the limit that r goes to 1. Okay. The limit r goes to 1, f is going to become a very large number, and this is going to go to 0. Okay. So. 
The next thing, as R goes to 1, if we look at the transmitted light, and we'll see this maybe better when we look at the plots in a second, but I'll state it now. As R goes to 1, the transmitted light is going to become narrow, bright fringes on a dark background. It's going to become essentially delta functions. Um, it's going to be 0 except um, for uh, when the sine squared of delta goes to uh, 0. And so we're going to get narrow, bright fringes on a dark background. Now for the reflected light, as R goes to 1, the reflected light becomes narrow, dark fringes on a back, uh, bright background. So anyway, that's all stated down here, so especially for those of you, you out in TV land who don't have the notes yet. So as R goes to 1, the reflected light becomes narrow, dark fringes on a bright background. And of course, these two will add up to whatever the incident radiation is. Okay. Well, let's look at a couple of plots here. And um, see what we have. We'll first look at transmitted light. And I think a problem maybe with your uh, handouts, it's in black and white. So the uh, legend here doesn't help you too much. Anyway, this guy is where the reflectance is 0.04. This guy here. Green is where the reflectance is 0.18. And where the fringes get sharper, that's where the reflectance is 0.8. So if we look at these, the maximas are at the same location independent of reflectivity. Okay. If we have low reflectivity, we're going to have low contrast fringes. And it kind of looks sinusoidal. And we'll have an equation for that in a minute. But it kind of looks sinusoidal. As the reflectivity becomes larger, the fringes become steeper. Okay. And as we go to point 0.8, now they really become steep. If I'd gone to 0 0.9, 0 0.95, 0 0.98, they really would have been even steeper. And they go pretty close to zero down here with 0 0.8. And um, they're going to get closer and closer to zero as the reflectance goes up. OK. You know, when I look at this, curve, how it dips down so fast. I was thinking there's two words that come to mind here when I look at this. One word is Utah, and the other one is Wyoming. Mm -hmm. anyway, sorry, I just had to mention that. Anyway, we'll come back to this curve in a minute. Now we're going to look at the reflected light. So again, you're, uh, you have trouble telling what, which is which on your black and white handout. So this little thing down here is the reflectance of 4%. You probably could guess that. And the one in between here is the reflectance of 18%. And then the steep guy here is the reflectance of 80%. And so these guys, if I can get both in here for a second, maybe. Can we just uh, zoom so I can look at both these for a second? I mean, you can see that they are indeed complements of one another. Okay. So if you add the two up, you're going to get unity. Um, okay. So now I'll make you make you zoom back in on this one again. Okay. Thanks. So again, the minimas at the same location, independent of what the reflectivity is. And it's just as the reflectivity becomes higher, the curve becomes steeper. And um, uh, the maximum um, 
intensity goes up of the reflected light as the reflectivity becomes larger. So for a for IT over II, for the intensity transmission of maximum, we have that the sine squared of delta over 2 is equal to 0. Or for a maximum in the transmitted light, we would have that 2 nd cosine theta is equal to m lambda. And if we go through the same procedure, we'll see that that's where we get the minimum in the reflected light. 2 nd cosine theta is equal to m lambda. The, it's the exact same result that we got for two beam interference. The locations are the same of the maximum for the transmitted light, the minimum for the reflected light. And the way to think about this when we get zero reflection here is that all beams after the first reflection are subtracting from the first reflection and they cancel it out. Now, I told you last class that this class I was going to tell you what I think is the most amazing thing in, in optics. Well, at least one of the most amazing things in optics. So I'll take a sip of coffee, and then I will tell you what I think that is. I'm going to stare at this graph. OK, let's say we're going to do this experiment here. And uh, I'm going to go out. I'm going to buy two mirrors. And I'm going to pay a lot of money for them because I want very high reflectivity. I want a reflectivity of 99.9999999%. Okay? I'm not sure where I buy these mirrors, but Edmonds or someplace. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to take one of the mirrors and, um, and uh, hold it up here in front. And I'm going to illuminate that with a light source that has a very narrow line width. And I'm going to illuminate it normal incidence. And so when I illuminate this mirror, I get 99.9999999% of the light reflected back. Teeny, weeny little bit gets through, almost nothing. Okay. Now I'm going to take a second mirror, and I'm going to give it to someone in the back row. Is anyone back there? Who wants to hold this mirror? One of you. One of you back there. Hold the mirror, okay? In your mind, anyway, hold the mirror. You have to hold it very steady, too, I should warn you. Probably shouldn't be anyone who's drinking coffee. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm drinking. Maybe since I'm drinking coffee, maybe you should be drinking coffee. Maybe we can kind of shake together or something. I don't know. Anyway, we're going to put these two mirrors, mine in front and yours in back, and we're going to space these just right. So 2nd cosine theta is equal to m lambda. And so what's going to happen is that even though this first mirror reflects back 99.9999999% of the light, that after a period of time, according to this curve, 100% of the light is going to be going through the system if you hold your mirror in back, just the right location. Do you believe that? I mean, this first guy is reflecting back 99.99999% and we put these two mirrors together just right, the right spacing, and 100% goes through. Isn't that amazing? I mean, and I mean, theoretically, that it works. And if I could actually buy these mirrors and I didn't have losses in them and stuff, it would work. And what is happening here is that only a teeny weeny little bit of light gets through, okay? And it goes back and hits the mirror in the back, and almost all of it's reflected back. And then only a little teeny weeny bit of that finally gets back through this mirror again. But if I have the spacing just right, that little bit of light that gets back through is going to be out of phase with the light that was initially reflected from this mirror. And so I'm going to have a little bit less light reflected. So more light gets through. So that goes in the back, and it comes back here again. And you know a little bit more gets through this mirror. And again, it's going to be out of phase with what was initially reflected. So less light's going to be reflected. And so after a period of time, as we build this up, all these reflections, I finally get the condition where I am going to completely cancel out the light reflected off this mirror, and I'm going to get 100% through. Now, isn't that amazing? If that's not the most amazing thing in optics, it has to be close to it. But you could take a mirror, you know, 99.99999% reflectivity, 
And 10 miles away, we could put another mirror just at the right location. And after a period of time, 100% of the light would be transmitted through. Okay. Well, if I try this in practice, what will happen? And what will happen, and we'll see this in a later section here, but I mean, it works except that probably I have a teeny weeny little bit of loss on each reflection. Not much, but a little bit of loss. And in order for this to work, I have to have a lot of reflections, you know, infinite number of reflections. And I may lose only a little bit on each one, but I have so many of them that uh, I will end up losing most of the light due to the losses in the system. But theoretically, if I could produce this lossless, high-reflectivity mirror, boy, that would be a great thing to, a great demonstration. Okay. Any questions at this point? Are you experts on these uh, multiple beam reflectance transmission fringes and reflection fringes? And okay, well, let's go on. There's still a couple more things we can learn here. Section 7.1.7 .7 here. Low reflectivity approximations. Well, just the question is, what happens if we have low reflectivity? And you could probably guess the answer already. We've kind of seen it in our plots, in fact, that if r is small, then f will be small, and the equations for the reflected transmitted light, you can simplify them wherever I have them here. A few pages back. So f is going to be small here. And so uh, what we could do first, we can get rid of what we have in the basement there and just have an f up here. And here at 1 over 1 plus a small number, we could make 1 minus that small number. So we could approximate the reflected beam as f sine squared delta over 2, or if you like, f over 2 times 1 minus cosine delta. And for the transmitted light, becomes 1 minus f sine squared delta over 2, or 1 minus f over 2 times 1 minus cosine delta. The point is that we get cosine-shaped fringes here, and we get essentially like what we got with two-beam interference. Okay, And we sort of saw that in the plots. We saw that when we had a low reflectivity of 4%, Look kind of sinusoidal. And the same thing here for the reflected light. That for the low reflectivity, it's sinusoidal. So, I mean, uh, it works. Um, it's not too surprising that, the, that it works out that way. Well, the whole idea for getting um, multiple beam interference is that you like to have nice, sharp fringes. And the question might be, what do I mean by sharp? And so, just happen to have a section on that. And uh, I'll call it 7.1.8, which is going to be fringe sharpness. And the question is, how do you define sharpness? And uh, the way that you normally find it in the books is that they look at, they go up to the half intensity point, and they find the width at half intensity. And we will call that epsilon. And so, um, and going from one fringe to the next fringe, the phase changes by 2 pi. And then going from the center of the fringe to where the intensity drops to half the max on one side and half the max on the other is plus or minus epsilon over 2. And we will define finesse and not to be, again, be confused with what we called earlier the coefficient of finesse. This is something else. Finesse here is the separation of the adjacent, of the adjacent fringes, 2 pi, di divided by the width of the half max epsilon. Okay. So we know what's upstairs, 2 pi. We have to solve for epsilon down here. 
And so if we go to the intensity at half max, this delta, the phase difference between the two beams, is what, 2 pi m plus or minus epsilon over 2. And if we plug that into our expression for the intensity of the transmitted light, we would have 1 half is 1 over 1 plus f sine squared of, of um, oh, this is delta, okay, this is delta over 2. So it's sine squared of epsilon over 4, okay? Now, we can throw away this portion out in front because that's just taking us through our cycles, and we just need to see how we're, how we differ from the end of a cycle here. So I just put in the, the portion of delta over 2 uh, that differs from the m pi, and so we get an epsilon over 4 there. And um, the next thing we're going to do is, that, well, this is, you're really interested in the finesse only when the finesse is high, which means only, you're only interested in this is when you have high reflectivity. So you're only interested in this when f is large. So we will, um, and if f is large, epsilon is going to be small. We want sharp fringes. And so the sine squared of epsilon over 4 becomes epsilon over 4 squared. And so our finesse is 2 pi over epsilon. And from this equation here, just plug in that this is a sine squared of, and this is, a, excuse me, epsilon over 4 squared, solve for epsilon. And you'll see that epsilon is um, 4 divided by square root of f. And so the finesse here is pi square root of f over 2. And we plug in what f is, and uh, finesse then becomes pi square root of r divided by 1 minus r. And we see that as r gets close to 1, as the reflectivity goes up, the finesse is going to become a large number. For a small reflectivity, finesse is small and it's not very interesting. Now I think, you know, as you prepare for your test, um, I don't know if anyone will prepare for the test, but if anyone does, uh, you're often tempted to memorize every equation you see. And don't do that, please. I want you to remember that 2nd cosine theta is m lambda, something like that. But things like finesse, yes. I don't want you to memorize this for the expression of finesse. But I do want you to know how finesse is defined. I do want you to know that as r becomes large, the finesse becomes large, uh, but the exact equation, please don't, don't memorize that. I'd rather have you memorize some basketball scores or something like that if you like to memorize. Okay. Some basketball scores I also like to have you forget, too. Okay. Any questions on finesse? Okay, we said we had no losses and in our, in our uh, mirrors. And, um, I mean, every mirror you buy has a little bit of loss. And so the question is, what if we have a little bit of loss? How is that going to affect the result? So that takes us to section 7.2. And I call this absorbing coatings, but it's, it's really any losses. It doesn't have to be absorption. It could be scattering or whatever, but you have some loss. And um, maybe often on these coatings, I mean, you have a loss. It's not dielectric. You have uh, probably some phase change on reflection. And uh, to make life simple, I'm going to say the two mirrors making up our cavity are identical. So I have the same, we have the same phase change on reflection for these two mirrors. And so we could write here that delta is, well, the phase we get due to propagation through the material plus the phase change on reflection. Okay. Now if I go back here, and I need to find a, my first drawing. What, I'm, what we're going to look at here is only for the transmitted light. We'll make some comments on the reflected, but the equation we're going to go through is only for the transmitted light. And the nice thing about the transmitted light is that 
you know, every one of these guys is transmitted through this surface once and transmitted through this surface once. That's not true for the reflected light. For reflected light, you have one guy that's reflected and everything else has been transmitted through this guy. Uh, so they're treated a little differently. But for the transmitted light, everything is transmitted through these two surfaces. And so if, if I were to go back and say, well, I have some absorption, it will turn out, if you go through this, and the interested student probably will go through it, you'll see that up to this point where we got the equation here, we said nothing, you know, we, we still could have losses on these surfaces. The next step, we assume that uh, P plus R was 1, but up to this point, we had not. So we still can write this, even if we have some, we can write this for the transmitted light, even if we have some losses in the system. And so we'll just go ahead here. Now, say we do have some losses. And um, so I'll just rewrite this. I'm just going to factor out the t squared and the 1 minus r squared. And so I get 1 minus r squared over the 4 r. So that becomes f. So I have the result here that transmitted light over incident light is t squared over 1 minus r quantity squared times 1 over 1 plus f sine squared of delta over 2. Before, when we had no losses, we could say this first guy was equal to 1. t squared was equal to 1 minus r quantity squared. So I could put that equal to 1. Now we have a loss. And so we have some loss for a. And again, it does, you know, a sounds like I'm only talking about absorption. But it's any loss I have, scattering, whatever. I can lump it in, call it a. So now I would have r plus t plus a is equal to 1. In other words, t is equal to 1 minus r minus a. So now what I'm going to do is to take this and plug it in there. And I get this expression, 1 minus a over 1 minus r quantity squared times this normal thing, 1 plus f sine squared delta over 2. And I will, so what I have are the normal fringes that I get for transmitted light. But here, I get some coefficient out in front, and I can think of that as the maximum transmission, whatever that is, because this can become 1. So this is my maximum transmission. So it's 1 minus a over 1 minus r, which is a correct expression, but it's not the way you normally see it. Normally, we have that uh, <coughs> we, we play around with the equation a little bit here and uh, uh, put in what r is equal to, or 1 minus r is equal to. And if we play with this, then we have the result that this is equal to 1 divided 1 plus a over t. If a is equal to 0, no absorption, this goes away, and we have 1. If we have some absorption, then the total transmitted light is reduced by some amount. Okay. Well, I think there are a couple ways that you remember things very well. One way is if you miss something on a test, you always remember it the rest of your life. Okay. The other thing is if you waste a lot of money, you make a foolish mistake and waste a lot of money, you remember that the rest of your life. I have a lot of memories, I have to say. But uh, one in particular has to do with this. And I had a student, a um, very, very bright student, who uh, was doing an experiment where we needed uh, multiple beam interference. He was doing an optical subtraction experiment, actually. Well, we need multiple beam interference, and we wanted very sharp fringes. And um, so we went out, and we bought some expensive mirrors of fairly high reflectivity. I want to go through some numbers. I state the numbers in the notes here, but this is such a horrible experience. I want to relive it as much as possible. And uh, so we'll talk about it here. Because I don't want you to throw away money the way, way I did. Maybe we can zoom the other way. 
Can we? No, zoom in the other way so I can see more area. Okay. That's okay, fine. So we went out, we bought some mirrors, according to the salesman. How many of you believe salesmen? Okay. Anyway, according to the salesman, the reflectivity was 99.7%. Okay. And the absorption was very good. It's, and I, you know, again, I'll emphasize this. This is both absorption and scattering. And this is only like something like 0.2%. I mean, it sounds pretty good. And so if we go through the transmission here, let's see, 99.7, 0.2. Uh, this must be about 0.1%. So we'll just go through this little calculation here. 1 plus A over T squared. And so this is 1 over 1 plus 0.2 over 0.1 squared. So even without a calculator, I can sort of do that. That's what? 1 over 3 squared, about 11%. So we buy this mirror, or two mirrors, actually, two mirrors, and we get pretty sharp fringes, but we only get, you know, if, if this is what the mirrors really are, we only get 11% of the light transmitted through. But, you know, kind of so what? We wanted sharp fringes, 11%. Let's turn up the laser power, and that's fine. Okay. Well, let's say what we what we might have gotten, which is closer to what we actually got, for sure. Well, you know, I'll, I'll take the salesman's word. It probably was 99.7 percent reflectivity. But let's say the absorption was not 0.2 percent. Let's just say it was eh, not much more. We won't add too much to it. Let's say it's 0.29 percent. Still. Sounds pretty good to me. Okay. And so the transmission here is now, what is it? 0.01%, I guess, to add these up to 100%. Okay, well, what do we get now? 1 over 1 plus A over T squared is 1 over 1 plus 0.29 over 0.01 squared, 1 over 30 squared, or about 0 0.0011, 0.11%. Not much light. And I still remember these mirrors. We set them up, and you go in a room, and you shut off the light for 15 minutes or so. So you could actually see something. And I'll tell you, those fringes were sharp. They were really sharp. But boy, were they dim. And uh, completely useless. Sharp, but no light. So anyway, this is something, be careful. I mean, if you get, you know, you like to get real high reflectivity, you get the finesse as high as possible. But boy, it doesn't take much absorption then to just kill you. So you get no light through the system. And of course, what is happening is that we're not losing much by each reflection. Number is small, but high reflectivity, you have a lot of reflections, and it adds up, and you have no light left. Okay, Painful, expensive experience. OK. So anyway, I give the numbers in here. And the, the other thing, that there is a phase change on, on reflection. and. So what does that do to your fringes? Does that change the shape of the fringes any? If you have absorption, you get this phase change on reflection. And the answer is no, it's not going to change the shape of the fringes. It will shift the fringes. The little, there may be a little tricky thing if you, um, if you go to large angle of incidence, because now the phase change on reflection you get is different for the, uh, for the two different polarizations. And so you could actually get two sets of fringes one for one polarization, one for the other, and they could be shifted relative to one another uh, because of the phase change on reflection. And if you're really unlucky, they could be shifted just the right, you know, right out of step 180 degrees. But anyway, 
you, the real thing is you might get two sets of fringes. So that was the, the transmitted case, the case for transmitted light. The case for reflected light, we're not going to do. And it becomes much more tricky because in reflected light, this first guy here is treated differently from the other guys. The first guy does not get transmitted through here. And uh, well, all these guys are transmitted through. So they're treated differently, so the derivation is much more difficult. Um, the, the real effect is that if you have absorption is that you the reflected interference pattern will not go to zero that probably these guys here will not add up to cancel out the first guy and so it will not go to zero okay so that's uh, a few comments on when you have um, losses in the system you have any questions <coughs> February Perot, 7.3. So one question, did Fabry Perot run for president once? Uh, must, must have been a relative or something. Okay. Okay. Anyway, what we do at Fabry Perot is just a, a good application of, of um, multiple beam interference. And so we have two mirrors here, high reflectivity, separation D, inside, uh, the angle here is uh, theta inside and remember we're getting these uh, you know 2, two nd cosine theta is m lambda stuff and so to, to really get these circular fringes we have to have light incident at, at a lot of angles of theta okay and so one way of doing that not the only way but one way to do that is to have an extended source here and uh, you know, kind of simple to think that maybe we'll put a lens here in the front focal plane. I mean, put the extended source in the back focal plane of the lens. So each point here will produce collimated beam at some angle. Okay. So and if I have a large source here, I have a lot of angles. Okay. Put a lens afterwards. Look in infinity here. So we go in the focal plane of this lens, and for each. You know, each angle here, for any given angle, the light's focused at some point. And so if we have different angles, light is focused at different points. Here. And, uh, you know, we, a given angle may give a bright fringe or it may give a dark fringe or whatever. And, uh, you know, for bright fringes of order M, we're getting about, well, for bright fringes of order M, we would have that M is is 2nd cosine theta over lambda naught and um, I put in a phase change on reflection of each surface of, of uh, phi and I divide it here by 2 pi so this would be my expression for a uh, uh, the bright fringes um, and so again we have to have a lot of angles present in order to get my whole set of fringes. At each point on the fringe pattern just comes from one particular angle. So that's a Fabry Perot. Any questions on that? How many of you have used a Fabry Perot in lab? One? Oh, okay, quite a few. Good. Good. Did you love it? Yeah, of course you did. Okay. Well, the nice thing about the Fabry Pro, one use of it, is to use it to identify wavelengths that are present. And so what I want to talk about now is what determines the uh, uh, resolution of this. How small a wavelength change can I, can I measure with this? So we'll go to 7.3.1, which is called resolving power. Now let's say let's say we have two wavelengths present for simplicity, lambda one and lambda two, 
And let's say that lambda 2 is equal to lambda 1 plus some small change in wavelength delta lambda. Now, so we get a set of fringes for each wavelength. So we're going to have two sets of fringes here. And the question is, when can we resolve these two sets of fringes? And the answer here is that, well, we, you know, it's, it's kind of fuzzy, and just when you can resolve. But we're going to pick a criterion form. And the criterion that we're going to use in this class is that the two lines, two wavelengths, are just resolved at the half maximum intensity of the peak of order m for one wavelength coincides with the half maximum intensity of the peak of order m also for the second wavelength. So here is one wavelength, order m. Here is the fringes due to the other wavelength of order m. And we're saying that we're just barely resolving these two if the half intensity, the 0.5 point here, for the two fringes fall on top of one another. And so this is showing the two individual lines. And if we add the two lines together, what we really would see in the lab would be something that looks like this, where we have a little dip in the center of something on the order of 20%. But the point is we're saying that they're resolved if the half intensity maxes coincide. OK? Now, not all books agree on that definition. And in fact, the Bible. Born and Wolf has a slightly different uh, criterion. And the criterion that they pick is that when you add up these two, the sum here, in the center here, this sum is equal to 0 0.811 times that of the maximum. So it's pretty close to what I have here. This dips about 20%. And so this is close, but it's not exactly what Born and Wolf has. So they want to say these two lines are resolved if the center here dips to 0 0.811 of the maximum. And we're assuming that both of these lines have the same intensity. And the, you say, why in the world? Where did it get 0 0.811? Why wasn't it 0 0.812 or something? And what they, what they do is that they say, well, if we had a sinc squared function, which we don't have, but if we had a sinc squared function, the this 0.811 would correspond to where the intensity maximum of one line coincided with the minimum of the second line. And they kind of use this because in a lot of other instruments where you're looking at resolving power, you do have um, images that go as a sinc squared. And so they're trying to express this in the same way. So that's, you know, I'll leave it up to them. If they want to do that, they can. Um, yeah, but they, the end result is very, very, uh, the difference is very small. And it turns out here that if we went through the Born and Wolf stuff, we would get an answer that would be 0.97 times the answer we're going to get. So I'm picking the easier way of doing it. And yeah, differs by 3%. And so it doesn't, uh, doesn't really make any difference. OK, so let's go through here and see if we can determine what the, what the resolution is. Let me check something real fast in the notes. OK, okay so again, our, the equation that you've all dreamed about is delta is 4 pi over lambda um, nd cosine theta plus 2 phi. And this is a. You know, the 2 phi is a little phase change on reflection. And it's, it's pretty, you know, the effect is the shift to fringes. It's pretty small compared to this big guy here, normally d, d over lambda or nd over lambda is a fairly large number. And uh, this is, so this is much larger here. Well, if we go back to our definition of finesse, we have that delta delta of 1 half intensity is 2 pi over the finesse. Finesse was, was defined as 2 pi divided by this quantity right here. 
And um, then the next thing we note that if we um, if we simply go back to this expression here and take derivatives, we'll see that delta delta is minus one over lambda delta delta lambda. Okay. In other words, and I see my little mistake here. This should go the whole length, not just half the length. Um, so lambda over delta lambda and delta over delta delta differ only by a minus sign. So we'll get rid of that by taking the absolute value here. And delta over delta delta is, well, delta for a bright fringe is 2 pi m. And uh, delta delta is 2 pi over the finesse. So this ratio here of wavelength to what you can resolve, delta lambda, simply goes as m, the order number, times the finesse. Kind of interesting. So resolve, and we'll, we'll define this as a resolving power. It's the wavelength divided by the smallest change in wavelength you can resolve. This is m times the finesse. And I then just go back in the notes and plug in what finesse is. So that's m times pi square root of f over 2, f being coefficient of finesse. It's equal to m times pi square root of r divided by 1 minus r. So that's our resolving power. And if we go near normal incidence, I don't have to worry about cosine theta. M is uh, about 2nd over lambda. And again, um, this guy is small compared to here. So we can say M is about 2nd over lambda. And so the resolving power is 2nd over lambda times the finesse. So 2nd is the optical path the light travels in going through the cavity and then reflected back again, divided by lambda. So this is a measure of how many wavelengths fit inside the, um, uh, the cavity here. And then the finesse is something that's re related to the reflectivity. And so this is some way related to how many bounces how many effective bounces or reflections you have, or how many effective bounces you have in the cavity, how many times the light goes through the cavity. So it's number of wavelengths in the cavity times some effective um, uh, number of times you go through the cavity. That's kind of interesting, OK? We'll come back to that in a second. Well, just going on here, I guess I'll say a couple more things. I mean, the resolution is proportional to the mirror separation. And if we go through here just to do kind of a, a um, um, calculation, simple calculation here, uh, I'll put in a finesse of 30. So reflect. if you calculate backwards, that's a reflectance of 90%. Uh, ND. 4 millimeters, so the refractive index times the length of the cavity is 4 millimeters. Wavelength of 500 nanometers. And I plug that back into my expression up here. And I get a resolving power of 5 times 10 to the fifth, which means that for a wavelength of 500 nanometers, I can detect a change in the wavelength of 500 nanometers divided by 5 times 10 to the fifth, or 0.001 nanometers. Okay. So that's pretty good. Well, let's say I want to get a little better resolution, resolving power. I want to resolve even smaller changes in the wavelength. How might I do that? Well, that's where we come back to our expression up here. And we see, well, there's two ways of increasing the resolution. One is I can go out and spend more money and buy a 
by higher reflectance mirrors and get a higher finesse. But I'm low on my budget. So why don't I just make D larger? Why don't I just take these two mirrors and increase the distance between the two mirrors? And I could increase the resolving power. In fact, it looks to me as though I could increase it indefinitely. I could just make this mirror as widely spaced as I want and get any resolving power that I want. Doesn't that sound great? Do you believe it? You do? Okay. Boy, I have some things to sell you. Anyway, I mean, you can. You, you, you do increase D, you increase the resolving power, but there are very few things in life you get for nothing, and so you probably create some other problem. And what we create is another section here, 7.3.2 which is free spectral range. And the problem we're going to get is that when we went back here, we said this was order M for wavelength lambda plus delta lambda. This was order M for wavelength lambda. And the problem we're going to get when we separate these mirrors is that we're going to get overlap of orders. And so this might be order M and this might be order something else, who knows what, but they, they differ, okay? And we get confused because we have this overlapping of orders. And so what's going to happen here is that we're going to have a limit on what wavelength difference we can have uh, because it, it will be, we're going to calculate here what the wavelength difference is at which the overlapping takes place. And this wavelength difference is what we call the free spectral range. So in other words here, we have, oops, over, Mathematica doesn't have a spell checker. Okay. We have the overlapping, uh, which will take place when order M of wavelength lambda 2, so lambda 1 plus delta lambda, falls on top of order M plus 1 of wavelength lambda 1. Okay, so we're saying m plus 1 times lambda 1 is m times lambda 2, which is m times, well, lambda 1 plus delta lambda. And we play here for just a few seconds, and out pops the result that delta lambda then is lambda over m. So this is a spread we can have uh, such that overlapping just barely takes over. So if we have a spread less than this, the overlapping will not uh, will not take over. So here we'd have the delta lambda free spectral range is lambda over m, and I plug in here that m is 2nd cosine theta um, divided by lambda. Kind of forgetting about the phase change on reflection because that's small compared to these numbers. And so we have the free spectral range is lambda squared over 2nd cosine theta. So that sets a limit on how large a spectrum, a spectral width we can have before we get overlapping of, order, of orders. And maybe I would plug in here that let theta go to zero. And so delta lambda free spectral range is lambda squared over 2nd. And uh, C is equal to nu times lambda. So I could, and maybe I should write that down. Although everyone knows it. And so I could solve for a um, uh, free spectral range and frequency. It's just C over 2nd. Hmm. I think I've seen that some way in lasers or something in the different modes and all this stuff. Anyway. That's your free spectral range. And so if I make D large, because I wanted, I wanted to increase D so I could get a high resolving power, but if I make D large, then my free spectral range becomes small. Okay. So delta lambda free spectral range is lambda over M. Delta lambda resolution, we said was lambda over m times finesse. And so if I kind of take the ratio of these two, 
the free spectral range over to over the resolving power resolution I should say and left with a finesse which was pi square root of f over 2 or in terms of reflectivity was pi square root of r divided by 1 minus r. So once again, I mean, I this becomes a better number if r becomes large. So, you know, you like to save on the price of the mirror maybe by making the cavity larger, but the real thing to make a better system is you really want higher reflectivity. And that will increase your ratio of free spectral range to what you can resolve. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, well, let's go on. Three minutes left, I think. Seven point three point three. Now, this is something I think is very neat. It's a very, very clever idea. And what we're going to do, so a spectrometry with a Fabry-Pro Edelon. What we're going to do is that we're going to combine a Fabry-Pro with a prism. And what we're going to see is that the prism does the gross separation to eliminate the free spectral range problem. And the Fabry-Pro is going to give us a high resolution. So let's think about this for a second. What, I'm going to have a source here, which is a slit perpendicular to the paper here, perpendicular to your TV monitor. Collimate the light. Well, collimate it in one direction. We still, since it's a slit this way, you're going to have light going this way. But collimate that. Forget about the Fabry Pro for the time being. I'll take that away. Send the light through a prism. So we're going to get dispersion. And we come over here with our lens. We focus it down. So this put the slit in infinity. This images the slit over here. But I have this dispersion coming from this guy. So I'm going to get a lot of images of the slit for the different wavelengths. So I'll get red up here, you know, green here, and blue down there. Okay. So this is separating the wavelengths. At any given region, I have a small spread of wavelengths depending upon the, the prism here and, what, uh, and how wide the slit is and how good this these lenses are. But certainly up here, I have only red light. I don't have blue light. Down here, I have only blue light. I don't have red light. Okay. Now I'm going to put in the Fabry Pro. And the Fabry Pro is going to give me some interference fringes here. And, you know, I get these nice circular fringes. But if I look at the blue light, the only, you know, the only part of this I'm getting is what's within this slit region. Because I don't have all these other angles. To get all these fringes here, I have to have all these angles present. I don't have all those angles present. I have angles in this direction, but I don't have angles in this direction. So all I'm going to get here is in this image of the slit, I will get little fringes here, but I won't see the stuff outside because those angles aren't present. And so over here in the blue, I'll get, you know, these little fringes. Green, I'll get these little fringes. Red, I'll get these little fringes. And we're about out of time. So what we'll do, we'll come back, we'll talk a little bit more about this, and really hopefully learn to appreciate the power of this idea of doing a gross separation and then a high resolution, splitting the work up between two elements. So I'll see you bright and early next Thursday morning. Don't forget your homework, and you have old homework to pick up over on the left.